Um, got a number of people already um, what, uh, joining us this morning. Thank you to um, everybody who is joining us. I know some more will be joining in. Um, so um, again, thank you for spending your, your morning with us. Uh, I'm very excited to have this discussion. I think we're going to learn a lot and I'm really hoping to get more information from our panel members here. Um, my name is Luigi Del Puerto. I'm the associate publisher and editor of the Arizona Capital Times. Uh, the Arizona Capital Times, of course, covers state government. If you don't have a subscription, uh, let me know. Send an email. Uh, put a question in on via the uh, chat room here, and uh, we'll get you squared away. Um, I want to thank our sponsor this morning, the Arizona Commerce Authority, for engaging with us this way. Uh, the ACA is the state's leading economic development organization with the mission to grow and strengthen Arizona's economy. The ACA uses a three-pronged approach to advance the overall economy. Uh, recruit out-of-state companies to expand their operations in Arizona, work with existing companies to grow their uh, business here and beyond, of course, and partner with businesses, large and small, to create new jobs and businesses. The Arizona is, I'm sorry, the Arizona Commerce Authority is overseen by a public-private sector board composed of Arizona's leaders in business and policy. Um, to our audience, if you're just joining us right now, um, we will talk about what kinds of resources are available for small businesses. And of course, I do want you to ask questions. And so if you can um, take the time to send in your questions via the, the chat room, um, we'll try to get uh, to them um, as many as uh, as many uh, questions as we can and we'll try to get um, you know answers um, and we are so fortunate this morning because we have as I mentioned our business leaders um, in the state uh, on the panel uh, we have Sandra Watson uh, who is the president and CEO of the Arizona Commerce Authority Sandra of course brings more than 20 years of economic development leadership experience to Arizona she had she and her teams have successfully attracted to Arizona more than 750 companies that have committed to invest nearly $10 billion in capital and create more than 125,000 jobs. During her tenure with the Arizona Department of Commerce and now the Arizona Commerce Authority, uh, Sandra has served in multiple positions, including business attraction, business development, innovation and technology, workforce and marketing divisions. Sandra, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Luigi. Are you, uh, are you in your office right now? I am. Good. Are you, uh, do you go there often? I do. I'm in my office every day, although all of our employees, we've got about 100 people here with the Arizona Commerce Authority and the Office of Economic, um, uh, Office of Economic Opportunities, and everyone is telecommuting. Good. Good, good. Um, also with us is Glenn Hammer, President and CEO of the Arizona Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Um, of course, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry is an organization that over um, Glenn's decade plus of leadership has become the state's most powerful advocate for job creators. The chamber has played, a, has played a leading role on behalf of the business community on a host of policy issues that have enhanced the state's competitive standing, ranging from taxation to education to healthcare, civil justice reform, business regulation, and much more. Glenn, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Luigi. You're also working from home. I am, yes, the, the home office. So if you hear uh, two teenage uh, young women come down the stairs for breakfast, please uh, don't be alarmed. Uh, same with me, I have an eight year old, so if you see him kind of walking <laughs> in in the back, background, my, my apologies in advance. Um, Paul Heckman also joins us today. Paul is president and CEO of the Arizona Bankers Association. Paul has served in this capacity since 2010. Prior to leading the team, he was a top advisor to Senator John McCain, where he served in several roles on his staff, including state director, chief of staff, and policy director. He serves on the advisory board for the Morrison Institute for Public Policy at Arizona State University. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Luigi. Are you just in your home office? I am. I'm do you, sheltered in place. Good. Do you, uh, do you go to your, office, your actual office? And how, how often do you do that? Uh, probably once or twice a week, just okay. to sign checks, pick up the mail, and make sure it's still there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are they still there? Uh, no. Our whole, our our staff, which is not large, are all uh, working from home. Cool. And then um, also with us this morning is Mike Torrell, 
president of the Arizona Federal, Federal Credit Union. Mike oversees business functions for commercial and residential lending at the Arizona Federal Credit Union. With over 30 years financial exper expertise, Mike co-founded co -founded and served as president and CEO of Choice Bank Arizona and chairman and CEO of Pinnacle Bank. Uh, both of these banks, by the way, have a combined asset of you know, more than almost uh, $400 uh, million. A recipient of Arizona's Business Leaders Award from 2013 to 2019, Mike was also chairman of the board for the Arizona Bankers Association from 2012 to 2016. He has represented financial institutions on a diverse range of local organizations. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I'm sure you were watching the Finance Advisory Committee uh, meeting um, in the state legislature a couple of weeks ago. So here's some of the findings from the JLBC's uh, uh, data. So over the last three years, and by the way, this data were from earlier in March, you know, when the, when the self-isolation, the stay-at-home order were not yet in, in effect. You know, we're starting to self-isolate at that point. So here's the data from JLBC. Over the last uh, three weeks, there were 247,000 new initial uh, unemployment uh, claims have been filed. Right? Phoenix hotel occupancy rates fell by 71% in the last week of March. Several restaurant chains uh, reported 70% decrease in sales. And of course, access caseloads grew by 42,000 in one month. That's an increase of 2.3%. Um, there was a business survey that was done by one of the uh, business groups we have here in Arizona. And it looks like um, a lot of people, a lot of businesses don't really um, foresee them going back to normal. Uh, we don't even know what normal looks like really um, until sometime maybe, um, you know, in, in, uh, in 2021, the next year. So let me start with, uh, with Glenn. Glenn, what is our, what is our business situation um, right now? And, and, it, and I guess, you know, I mentioned going back to full strength and I don't know if full strength is even the appropriate term, but what is, where are we at at this point? And when do you kind of expect us to, um, uh, reopen, maybe go back to normal? Well, f first of all, Luigi, I, I would say that uh, we're very fortunate uh, that we have Governor Ducey and his team on the case, because from our vantage point, they've handled the health and the jobs situation pitch perfect at this point. Uh, you take a look at the healthcare situation here, and it's much, much better than it is uh, pretty much anywhere else in the country. Uh, and then you take a look at some of the orders that have already uh, been out there in terms of essential services and activities. And what we've done is we've kept as much of the economy open as we possibly can while providing uh, for the safety and security of our citizens. You know, the, the first thing is we have to make sure our citizens are safe. We have to make sure that our hospitals don't get overwhelmed. But I, but I believe that, uh, the phase we're at now, with uh, particularly with the way the president has basically said to the governors, the 50 governors, it's your job to, to uh, figure out how best to open your states up within certain parameters. Uh, you know, I thought the governor held a very important call last week with business leaders across the state to get some ideas. And my, my final point is, you know, one part of this will be on the governmental level. Uh, but another part of this is going to be on the customer and consumer level. And, you know, I think that we're going to have to all on the employer side really think through the safety protocol so our employees feel safe and our customers feel safe. But, you know, we entered this recession with the strongest economy in the state's history, and we will exit it in, 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 in a shape where we can return to regular programming, uh, I believe a lot faster than most other states, if not all the other states. Uh, Glenn, just a quick follow up on that one. You mentioned, you know, of course, there's the government side, the political side of things, but there's also the, uh, quite frankly, as you know, as you mentioned uh, just earlier, uh, sort of the consumer confidence, where are they at this point, right? So is that one of the, uh, one of the factors that we're looking at then uh, when we might be able to reopen? 
Yeah, a a absolutely, Luigi. And that's why this is, this is really a, a, a touch game. I mean, we, we know that, you know, Arizonans, we want to work. We want to get back to work. We want to live our lives. But we certainly don't want to do so in a way that jeopardizes all the progress we've made to secure our hospitals for any sort of peak uh, from COVID-19. But we're going to have to do it in a smart way. And it's going to be industry by industry. And I think that there's a whole bunch of safety protocols. You know, I think some of the cultural things are going to change. I think we're going to see a lot more masks, as we've seen in other countries, uh, uh, particularly, uh, you know, say, like South Korea, Japan, China, Israel now, uh, Germany and Austria. But, uh, you know, Luigi, I, I also, one thing I just want to point out is I think, you know, we, there's great opportunities there. I mean, there's a bipartisan agreement. We need to bring back supply chains into this country and you take a look at the work this state has done on U.S. Mexico Canada uh, uh, arrangement and things like that we had more manufacturing jobs and construction jobs going into this recession I, I, I feel very good about where we will be uh, coming out of it but but at the yeah. end of the day it's going to be the virus and the health and safety of our people that will really dictate the timeline so let me go to Sandra real quick. Sandra, what's your, what's your take? When, when do you think we might be able to uh, reopen the economy? Well, I mean, I think that is what um, Governor Ducey, our uh, Department of Health Services are uh, contemplating right now. So as we gather more data, um, we'll be able to, or the governor will be able to make th those, those decisions. Um, and I believe it'll likely be more of a phased approach Obviously, in following CDC guidelines, the guidelines that were just released by the White House um, gives a roadmap uh, for every state as they decide to reopen their economy. So we're looking at that very, very closely. We're talking to businesses, as Glenn mentioned. We've had an extensive um, outreach with all of our business and community leaders, um, getting opinions, getting ideas thinking about what does the next phase look like for Arizona. Governor Ducey is weighing all of those options. As Glenn mentioned, our, the health and well-being of our citizens are a top priority. Um, and then uh, obviously, as we're able to open uh, businesses up, we will. The other thing I would mention is that um, as we were, um, as you know, the last three weeks, as we've been going through this crisis, uh, the governor has issued a number of uh, executive orders, um, and that is to protect not only the citizens of our state, but really to help our small businesses. And so that uh, in our economy is, is actually, um, as, as also Glenn mentioned earlier, is very, very strong. We had a very strong, very diversified economy, um, and our focus, obviously, is to continue down that path. Um, it's unfortunate um, that uh, at this point, We've had um, some challenges, obviously, um, and businesses have had to um, take a pause in some cases, uh, but there are a lot of other businesses that are currently operating. So as the governor established his executive order on essential businesses, um, as you'll see in that executive order, there are a number of businesses that are still operating. We see a tremendous amount of activity in our manufacturing industry. Uh, some of our manufacturers have pivoted to supplying uh, uh, personal protective equipment to our hospitals. And so we've seen a very collaborative effort among our manufacturers to ensure that our healthcare providers have the equipment they need. Thank you, Sandra. So let me, let me ask Paul. Um, Paul, what are, you, what are you seeing right now? What are you hearing from businessmen at this point? You know, you, you deal with a lot of businessmen who are trying, for example, to get loans, trying to survive this uh, this really virtual uh, economic standstill in some parts of our economy. Um, what are you hearing from them in terms of when they might want to reopen the economy and what sorts of indicators to you personally would, uh, would show that, you know, it might, be, it might be safe to go back to some kind of normal? Well, I think um, I'll echo what uh, Sandra and Glenn said. This is a resilient and robust uh, economy with uh, a lot of innovative business folks here. Um, it's a combination between a frustration uh, for those business owners that are unable to access the uh, capital they need to keep their employees and, and stay in business um, to some heroism with uh, some of the dynamism we've seen with businesses in terms of uh, you know, 
changing what they do to, to stay open. Um, I think Glenn could probably, he touched on it, but he could probably speak to what Honeywell's doing, you know, manufacturing, I think, masks and, and some PPE now, um, which is, a you know, uh, modifying their production. Um, but it's going to be tough, Luigi. It, as uh, Glenn said and Sandra touched on, you know, we've, we've got to do this slowly. Um, and we've got to do it sector by sector. Certainly, I think the hospitality industry is probably going to be one of the last sectors, and we are a hospitality state. Um, you know, we've got a lot here. We're the home of the Grand Canyon. Um, so, you know, while we wait for a vaccine, and hopefully we can get some prophylactic drugs that can, can help and some treatments that can help, um, we're really dealing with a highly transmittable uh, disease that's got a high mortality rate and it impacts our more vulnerable communities more than others. So we've just got to be really careful. And I think that our business and political leaders have shown that responsibility and I'm proud of them. Um, but in terms of coming out of it, it's, it, I think it's going to be, we're going to emerge slowly, um, but we will come out. There, the good news is there is an end to this. It was not a financially induced crisis, which take longer to recover from. We know when we have a vaccine, um, we can completely emerge. And we'll probably be in Arizona stronger than we were before. So, Mike, um, l let me ask your thoughts on this one. When um, I, I do wonder what the economy looks like when we, you know, get back to some kind of a normal. Like from your end, you're dealing with, you know, with businesses that are, quite frankly, simply not doing any business at this point. What are you hearing from them? Well, I think that they're the, one of the biggest concerns that we all have is, you know, who comes out of this and survives. And I think some of the programs that we've put in place or that Congress has put in place that we're trying to implement is uh, going to, gonna, you know, give people a chance. But there will be some that don't, the doors won't reopen. Um, and we've got to come to grips with that um, reality. Um, but as a result of that, you know, new things will emerge and, and we will come out and be, we could be, you know, stronger in other areas. And we're going to learn to do things differently, not only from a business standpoint, but from a financial standpoint and how we implement. I mean, one of the things that we quickly learn on the financial side is that, uh, you know, we can do things quicker than we've done them. Uh, this uh, CARES Act and particularly the pay, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, as it was thrust upon us, um, we're... We're, we're, we're learning quickly how we can move faster with our government partners. Um, and maybe as this hopefully doesn't happen again, but if it could, if it did, and as we move forward, um, we're going to be better the next time and we'll be better prepared. I mean, these are generational defining events. I've explained that to both my daughters that, you know, these are the things that, you know, as we all remember line nine 11 and, probably a slight exaggeration, but we used to get on airplanes with guns, knives, smoke cigars, and have cigarettes next to pregnant women. Uh, and they, they were mortified to even hear that kind of stuff. And, and this one thing's going to develop out. This is going to help us be a much stronger economy. Thanks, Mike. You know, so I was, uh, I was talking to rest of the long uh, 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 what, uh, a couple of days ago. And, uh, what they told me is that um, there's about 150,000 workers in the restaurant industry that don't have jobs right now, and that they suspect that maybe as many as 70,000 of them uh, would have been lost permanently. Now, you know, obviously you're right, right? Our economy was in a roaring state before this uh, crisis, and so um, you know, I'm I'm with you all. I'm hoping that we can uh, come back really strong and and. Um, and be even st stronger, um, you know, next year. Let me ask Sandra. Sandra, what can you just lay out for us? What, so we have a we have restaurant owners, right? We have uh, hotel uh, owners. We have clinics, all kinds of clinics in in uh, you know in uh, strip malls. Um, uh, we have uh, dental clinics, all sorts of businesses that, quite frankly, don't have any business right now. And we have a whole lot of people that, uh, you know, are very worried because they don't have work. What's, let's talk about the, the small businesses specifically, because that's, that's really what we have in Arizona. A lot of them are small businesses. Lay out for us what's available to them. Okay. And so you're absolutely right, Luigi. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Um, 
very uh, critical to uh, our economy balancing back. Um, we have 575,000 small uh, businesses in our state. Uh, four to five of those are non-employer businesses. So they do not have a paid employee. So that's about 80% of our businesses are considered non-employer businesses. That leaves the remainder of 20, 20%. Which is roughly about 115,000 businesses. Of the 15, uh, out of the 115,000 businesses, there is about a hundred, just over a hundred thousand of them are businesses under 500 employees. And the definition of a small business, according to the SBA, are businesses under 500. Um, Congress has put together some uh, some programs, as many of you know, uh, through the CARES Act that are available for businesses that are under 500. So we've got about 100,000 businesses that are eligible for these programs. And there's a number of them. The Paycheck Protection Program is one. The Economic Dis Disaster Injury Loan is another. They just came out with a new program called the Main Street Program. Um, and, um, and there are other tax advantages that they've implemented through the CARES Act. They put in uh, roughly about $349 billion in the Paycheck Protection Program alone. Um, we've we've uh, about 19,000, just over 19,000 of our businesses were successful in receiving uh, an award, which we're very excited about. That's, that's about $4.9 billion of uh, funding that will be going to our small businesses who have received uh, funding. So we're very excited about that. Good news is that there was money available. The bad news is that they ran out of money, uh, but we are working obviously with our congressional delegation uh, and our partners, the Arizona Bankers Association with Paul and his leadership, Glenn, Mike, and, um, and all of our partners to ensure that monies are made available for our small businesses. What we're hearing is that roughly um, there, will be, there, there will likely be another $250 billion or actually I should say $310 billion dedicated to that program. Um, $250 will, will be through the banks, very similar to the program that currently exists. The $60 billion will, be, um, will go through the community banks and our community uh, development, or our CDFIs. So basically what that will allow is our micro businesses an opportunity to get funding. Uh, some were able to get funding through this first, through the first tranche, but um, we're hoping that more of our businesses will be able to access those programs. Uh, Senator, you mentioned that there's about $5 billion available to Arizona, right? From the, um, right. From the um, uh, small business loans uh, under the CARES Act. Um, has and you mentioned the money's run out. I mean, I, I can imagine the, just the number of people uh, flooding in to try and take advantage of this. How, is there money left here in Arizona? How, where are we at, you know, in terms of exhausting that amount that's available to us? Well, that uh, entire amount has been awarded. So for Arizona, we received $4.9 billion. Um, that money is awarded to over 19,000 businesses. Um, we were having a conversation with the SBA representatives and they were sharing with us yesterday that um, they were, uh, with the $349 billion available to small businesses, they had received so many applications that they processed more applications in that program over the course of the last two weeks uh, than they had processed um, in 15 years. So that can uh, give you a sense of the, the demand on that program. The other uh, major thing to uh, note is that of, the, um, of all of the applicants, 20% received funding, that, which means 80% are still in the queue. Uh, so we've got a lot of applicants uh, here in Arizona. I would, I would estimate that we have thousands of companies who have applications in and they're just pending approval once that funding becomes available. Uh, Paul, um, what's the um, what's the reason for? Well, I don't I don't know if it's a delay. It seems like there's a delay in getting the amount to to the folks that need them, right? So we have, uh, you know, if Sanders correct, we have we have eighty percent of those who have applied waiting on on the money to actually come through. What's the what's the reason for the delay? And I guess the the other question is that. Huh, what can we do to kind of 
fast track that so that the, the folks that are applying can happily get the money right away. Uh oh, <clears throat> the delay right now is Congress. Um, the, the, the initial tranche, as Sandra alluded to, ran out um, in 14 days. So $349 billion, $350 billion uh, nationwide went out in 14 days. So now we're waiting for Congress to, to uh, pass that law that Sandra was referring to, the reappropriate that $310 billion. Um, and so, and we were expecting that to happen hopefully last Thursday, which it didn't. Um, they met over the weekend. Part of what they're putting in this appropriations bill is money for hospitals. Um, and they were um, trying to get some more money for the cities and municipalities and states. And I guess they're going to wait on that until what they call phase four, uh, the next coronavirus relief bill. Um, but they're, uh, from what I understand, they're, they're getting caught up over some um, funding for testing now. That doesn't, uh, that's not related to this program, but that's, as I understand, the last issue. They're going to try to get a vote today in the Senate. Um, they'll take, uh, hopefully they can do that. Then they'll get a vote the next day uh, in the House. Then it's got to get to the president for signature. And that can happen literally that same day. Then OMB has to uh, literally appropriate the money to uh, the SBA. That can take up to a day. So before this can, the spigots can get turned on here, that has to happen in Congress. With respect, Luigi, to uh, in terms of when the program's working, the, the uh, average time, um, it kind of depends on the complexity of the application and it depends on the bank uh, and how they're processing those applications. Um, but I, and Mike could speak to this better than I can, but I think it can get, it can happen within, it's, it's um, up to scale probably within about a week or 10 days. Mike, am I, am I um, too optimistic there or what do you think in terms of the processing? Oh, I think you're, you're probably right on. I, the, bigger, the biggest challenge that we had is this program, is the PPP program was thrust upon the banking, and banking industry. Um, I, I don't want to say we were ill-prepared, but it, it came upon us quickly. Normally, we would process you know, an SBA 7A loan uh, and receive authorization within a week for, let's say, a half a dozen. Uh, we were doing 20 an hour. Um, wow. You know, we got overrun by the amount of applications versus our manpower. Keeping in mind, we're all under quarantine or all um, staying at home and we don't normally work remotely. So we... I think we, we lost Mike's signal there. <laughs> um, um, Mike, uh, we lost you there for maybe uh, three seconds or so. You were talking about just the, the fact that you're overrun by the applications that you're not, oh, yeah. you know. There's no, there's no doubt about it. A, every institution in the state saw a, a, a landslide of, of applicants that came through the program in which, uh, you know, you just didn't have the horsepower. Plus, you were all working remotely, which wasn't a common practice for, you know, the members of the financial community. So. Uh, it was a perfect storm, um, and you're also dealing with, in fairness, the SBA's technology side. Let's be honest; they're not the, they don't have the greatest technology. Craig Jordan is a terrific man that runs the local SBA office, and he too is like, we're just we're getting inundated, and you know we would be trying to process authorizations for um, members and clients, and the system would go down, or we'd get people locked out. And, you know, these are all things that are new to us and they're probably very frustrating to our small business clients. Credit union and for the previous 30 years, I've been a banker in Arizona. Um, you know, Paul says I've kind of gone on, now I've been on both sides of this. Um, but I will say we're all in this together and it's been a very collegian effort. I mean, we're reaching across the institutions. This isn't a competitive environment. This is what did I learn today that I can help some other banks that can help their clients to get these loans. Um, we're, we're really pulling together like I've never seen this happen before. And we used to spend a lot of time, Paul and I would, you know, have what's the difference between credit unions and banks. Now the credit unions and banks are working together to help. It's, 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 it's very encouraging to see. Well, thanks, Mike, and I'm, I'm glad to see that kind of cooperation among the, the, the banking um, industry players. 
Um, that's, that's very good to hear. Um, let's break down the, the loan application process. So, um, you know, I, I run a newsroom, we have about a dozen people or so, so I'm definitely um, qualified under the small business definition, right? I have less than 500 people, fewer than 500 people. All right, so I'm, um, what's the, couple things, like where, what do I do? Uh, who's, who's, who exactly is eligible? What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I call? Sandra. Well, I think the first thing you do is uh, you reach out to your bank. Um, we've got a lot of information on our website um, that explains the program, the process of the program. So we put together an entire uh, business resource directory, uh, working obviously with Paul and Glenn and Mike to make sure that um, we have as much information as needed for those small businesses to be successful in this process. The information on the website will include not only a guide on how to apply for the program um, and what the criteria of the specific programs are, and I'll leave it to our industry experts to walk through the actual calculations, but also we've got a list of SBA lenders. And so in order to uh, participate in this program, you have to be a SBA lender. So we have, I think, Paul, I think we've got, what, 61 SBA lenders in our state? Yes, that's correct? about it. And so um, it's a combination, as Mike mentioned, all the banks are working very closely together, as are all of the uh, business support agencies, whether they're at the state level, the city level, the regional level, all of our chambers, um, all of our nonprofit groups. We're all united to make sure that all our businesses have exactly what they need in order to apply for these programs. So we've been hosting webinars, educational seminars to walk small businesses through the process. We've held two of those already. We've had over, um, I believe, close to 3,000 small businesses participate on those webinars. In addition to that, we've partnered with the Arizona Chamber and ASBA to do an informational um, video on how to apply for these programs. Uh, since there's a lot of information out there, the most important thing, obviously, is get in touch with a bank, start working with your bank, make sure if you don't have a relationship with a, a bank, make sure that you're talking to a, a number of them. There are some banks that are taking uh, new customers, and so it's really important to reach out to those banks. We've got all their contact information on our website. Um, so uh, they, can, they can pursue that. There's a lot of online services as well. There's some digital platforms that have been developed that small businesses can have access to as well. Uh, we have heard, obviously, uh, PayPal, Square, Intuit, a number of um, national firms who have developed these digital profiles as, or platforms as well to help small businesses. So I would say they can contact us. We'll make sure that small businesses go to our website. They can contact us directly. We have an entire team that has been working 24-7, answering the phones, making sure we're reaching out to our business community, letting them know that this program is available. We've established an entire toolkit for our economic development partners and uh, to ensure that they've got the information they need so they can supply that to their small businesses. So this really is a collaborative effort and uh, the entire community is working together to make sure that our small businesses know what's available to them. So I'll let the guys uh, talk about sp the specifics of the program and how they, you know, the calculations of the program, but there's, there's quite a bit of information uh, that we've, we've compiled and we're, we're there and available to help businesses in any way. So, so the first thing you need to do if you're a small business and you're struggling, you're a, uh doors are shut at this point is go uh, go talk to your lender right? go go talk to your financial institution and uh, and Glenn based on what you're hearing from the ground um, uh, businesses that have reached out to you given the very short time right we're in a crunch time we're having to process yeah. all these applications and you're getting all this influx of calls are we able to accommodate all these calls, for example? What are you hearing from the ground in terms of what challenges businesses are facing? Well, uh, as and others- I mean, have, I mean to say, yeah. in so far as the loan application process. So uh, I think what you've already heard, Luigi, is we're all in this together. I mean, this, the, 
Paycheck Protection Program has scaled up in a way we've never seen. And I just want to commend uh, the folks on the, the call. Uh, you know, we've been working with Paul for a number of times, number of years, and he's he's doing just a great job getting the word out, getting getting lenders ready to go. And Sandra's team at the Arizona Commerce Authority, I participated in one of the webinars, just off the charts good and very practical advice for small businesses. And I'll also say our congressional offices, our two U.S. Senate offices, have basically, they're basically mass units to help small businesses navigate uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, the economic injury, disaster loans, to help them when they get stuck. And as Sandra mentioned, you know, we partnered uh, with the Arizona Commerce Authority. Luigi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, because uh, I saw your lips move and I didn't hear any words. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't sure what was going on, but I can do that too. Uh, we have a website, caresactaz.com, caresactaz.com, backslash Espanol in Spanish as well. And what we've been trying to do is get to a lot of the companies and small businesses that are eligible, but maybe don't have as deep a relationship with the lending institution. And we've already, according to statistics that came in moments ago, have been able to reach out to hundreds of businesses across the state to help them apply. Uh, I'm very optimistic that Congress will uh, appropriate more funding for this program. I do believe that the overall uh, scheme of it's a little bit defective. It should not be first come, first serve. Every Arizona business that's eligible should be able to apply and receive the funds, just the way is the case for unemployment insurance. So, you know, so that extra $600 per person that's been displaced, uh, we should have that same level of seriousness for the small business owner who, through no fault of their own, could lose their life savings. So we're going to continue to push our congressional delegation very hard because I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. This week, Congress is going to put in more money for the Paycheck Protection Program, and it's not going to be enough. The burn rate on it is about $60 billion a day. So at the Arizona Chamber, we're gonna put, we're gonna keep the pressure on our federal delegation to every, until every small business in this state that's eligible can participate. Because one additional point here, Luigi, that's important. It's not just to keep that small business alive, which is so vitally important. It's to keep the employees connected to the employers. We have over a million people easily in Arizona that work for small businesses. And when you think about it, we've had 418,000 Arizonans apply for unemployment insurance in the last four weeks. A normal week before COVID-19 was 3,000. Uh, imagine how many more tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of additional Arizonans would be out of work today if not for the first tranche of the Paycheck Protection Program. That's for all the marbles right now in terms of saving our small business economy. And like the others uh, on, the, on, the, on this call, we're gonna fight to make sure Congress does its job and gets uh, more money appropriated. So I, I gotta, uh, I just wanna remind the audience that we're, we're talking to um, um, our state business leaders here on uh, what resources are available to businesses. We have Paul Hickman, Sandra Watson, Mike Thorell, and Glenn Hammer. Um, also, if you're just joining in, um, please send in your questions. We're going to ask, um, we're going to try and get to as many as we can. Um, and, and, uh, you know, and hopefully we'll, we're going to have some answers. So in fact, we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, here's one survival for many of us, small businesses depends on whether we are able to receive the payroll protection plan. Right? Um, yeah. so what chances do we have in this new go round to receive some support? I guess it's kind of the same question, right? If you're saying it's, uh, first come, first serve, the burn rate's pretty high. Really, if you're just going for the application process right now, it's not ready. Like, what are the chances you're actually going to get it? Let's, let's ha ask Paul and then Mike. Well, I would say, you know, get that application in during this pause. Get the documents that you need to get. You know you're going to need your payroll documents, um, and you're going to need to get the application filled out. So the application's on the SB website, so get those at a minimum first. Put it together and then you'll see what else you need um, from that the program covers um not less than you can use the loan for not less than 75 percent of payroll costs and not more than 25 percent of mortgage interest rent or utilities so if you're going to use it for some of those other uses you've got to be able to prove that up 
these are this is a hybrid that the federal government designed um, between a grant and a loan. Um, so that if you use the proceeds for the designated purposes, it's forgivable. And so remember this, you've got to go in after the, um, after the covered period ends, you've got to go back to your bank and you've got to prove up that you use those resources for the designated purposes. To the extent that you don't, that, that portion of the loan is not forgivable. Now I would say the rate is pretty reasonable. It's a 1% rate. Um, so it's, you know, you've got to make some, some business decisions in terms of what you're going to do there. Um, so that's kind of, I don't know if that helps Luigi, maybe Mike can weigh in a little bit as well. Let's ask Mike. I, I think Paul's right on. I think I'd get my application in with the, with the bank or credit union that I, I currently do business with. I'd get my payroll information as required by that checklist for that particular institution. I'd get it in the queue as quickly as possible. Probably say a little Mike, you're cutting in and out. I don't know if you can hear us. There you go. I lost you. I would get it in as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, certainly I'd be in, in communication with them to, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, get yourself in the queue and to close it as quick as possible. Luigi, one other thing that I just, I, I, we t we've spent a lot of time talking about the Paycheck Protection Program. But one of the things I mentioned earlier that I think we, that is not getting the focus is those small business owners today that ha currently have SBA financing in place, either under the 504 program or the 7A program. There is a section under the CARES Act, which is 1112, which is a subsidy program that will handle the subsidization of payments for six months for small business owners that have currently have SBA loans. This is another huge resource. If you think about it, a 7A borrower that currently has a loan while they're in the pay, looking for payroll protection as well, reaching out to their financial institution that carries their current loan and asking about the program. <clears throat> made for that small business owner. It's a huge deal. So Mike, how does that, how does that exactly work? I mean, walk through that again. So you have an existing loan with the SBA, right? With your, yes. your lender. All right. So, so what, what's, what in fact is available to you? So there's nothing, nothing other communication with the, the institution is necessary. You need to communicate with your institution, understand that the program is in place. There's very little that the small business client has to do. They just want to understand the program as it's being implemented by the financial institution. But essentially, the next six months of payments on all SBA 7A loans are deferred. Very similar to the Paycheck Protection Loan, which has a six-month deferral. Current SBA 7A loans have a deferment or a subsidy, which is pay, paid for by the SBA. And that begins April 1st. Uh, for the April 1st payment. Um, so um, how many of these kinds of applications are you getting right now? So it seems to me that this is an under, uh, I don't know what exactly the word is, it's underutilized, is that where, where we're at? And how much, uh, maybe Paul can answer too, how much is in fact available um, through this pipeline? Well, I'd, I'd ask the fruit of Mike on that. He's the expert on the loan. Well, on the, on, the, on the section, I, I lost you for just a second, um, but under the section 1112 um, subsidy program, it's, it's infinite. Uh, actually, the number is $17 billion. The SBA feels comfortable that they have sufficient funds to cover those payments for six months under the program. Um, I, don't under, I don't believe that they feel, they feel it's better for them to do that than to process deferments because they were, we were beginning to see an overrun of deferments being processed. And I think they made the smart move to say, it'd be easier for us just to make the payments for six months under the 504 and the 7A program. Uh, to meet those meet their needs and I think it will happen. I think and that's a huge resource If you have a payment of $10,000 a month and you don't have to make that payment for six months. There's 60 grand, right? Um, Mike you're 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 cutting in and out. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, no, no worries. So um, let me ask so here's one other question. So though the businesses that applied for the PPP and did not receive funding due to the funding running out, 
do they have to resubmit an application application once a new funding is available? Sandra, you were shaking your head. Yeah, you no, we were told by SBA that they don't have to resubmit. Those applications are already in the process. That's correct. All right. So the other thing, I, Luigi, if I can just uh, add one more thing, as we started talking about the Paycheck Protection Program and all these other programs that are available, obviously they're designed to ensure that we're helping our small businesses, those in the greatest need. Um, the other component of the Paycheck Protection Program is for those companies who have recently laid off their employees. This gives them an opportunity to go back as far as February 15th bring those employees back on and apply for those funds. So, um, so it's to avoid layoffs, but it also is to help those that have recently laid off to bring those employees back on, have them connected to their employer. Um, and so they're able to add those to their calculations as well. That's a huge thank link. you. Thank you, Sandra. So, so here's one question. If a small business uh, received confirmation of their application being processed, right? Is the money, from the original PP, PPP still being delivered or is that money uh, no longer available? If they received authorization from the SBA under the $349 billion and they know that their lender has received an SBA authorization through their e-trans system, they are in the queue for that original 349. It's just a matter of processing the documents for their execution under the plan. And, and Mike, just to uh, follow up on that one, what's the what's a what's a time frame for that one? What what, what are we looking at? We're we looking at days. Are we looking at two weeks? Oh, I think it's I think it's uh, if they've got an authorization, we're mandated by the SBA to close the loan within ten days. Ten days. Okay. Um, here here's one more question: Does a sole proprietorship or contractor need to have a business license to qualify for PPP? Maybe Sandra can answer. Uh, I would imagine that um, the guidelines suggest that um, sole proprietors and uh, uh, contractors are eligible for the program. So as long as they're eligible to operate, I would imagine they're eligible for the program. But maybe Paul and Mike have more information on that. They are, el they are eligible under, for the program. They began taking those applications on April 10th. And um, you can certainly go to our website to look at the checklist. It's very simple. Depending on if you're a 1099 employee, you're a Schedule 1099 employee, a Schedule C or a K-1, uh, the documentation is available there to tell you what's needed. Very simple process, application, documentation, and uh, away you go. So if, you're, if your business already received or got approved for a PPP loan, should they apply for the next amount of funding available? What's no, so, they can't. You can, this is a one-shot deal, Luigi. You can apply once. So that's, and that's a good point. Make sure if you're going to do this to maximize uh, what you, what, what the loan is that you're going to try to get. So, so don't think, well, I might have more trouble down the road. Maximize it up front. So, because you can't go back. It's a, it's a one, one-shot deal. You got it and that's it. Yeah. That's and what I would also encourage people is, um, once you're in the queue with somebody, stick with who you're with. Um, at what we've learned through this process and the uh, SBA's e-trans system, um, we've had small business owners, unfortunately, make multiple applications, run across each other, and get edged out of both banks or credit unions because they're applying at several different places, and none of the banks could help them. And it's really unfortunate. We so had a circumstances of that, like a very well-known small business that we all know in this in Arizona, they were unable to get funding because they applied at five different institutions. In fact, that was one of the questions, right? So I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. If I could just add to what Mike said, um, what the, what the the nature of this program being first come first serve, it's almost a gold rush, and the and the length of time that it takes to process an application, the the bandwidth that that takes. Um, if you've got a, if you get, if you apply at multiple banks and then you get the loan at one that, and you've applied at that one after you applied at the first one, all of that bandwidth was wasted. Um, and that means that potentially other small businesses didn't get the loan because their, their paperwork was behind your paperwork at a bank that you didn't need it because you got it somewhere else. Um, it's, it's, and I understand the angst and I understand the frustration, but it's very difficult. Uh, it's, we're all, as we've said, uh, as Glenn started saying it, we're all in this together and we want to try to help as many of these small businesses 
get through this as possible. If the if the bank has accepted your lo your loan paperwork, you're in that queue, um, and just uh, stick with that horse. So, and if, so in if, fact, if, that was. I'm sorry. Go if, ahead, Mike. And if you finish, and if you receive the funding, but you know that you have four other applications in four other institutions, call the other institutions, tell them you receive funding, so they can remove that. Because if not, we've got manpower that are working on things that are never going to happen. So don't don't go to multiple uh, lenders and 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 uh, apply uh, or make up multiple applications. Like stick with with one. And if you're already in that process, you're going through stick it. With it. Stick with it. Okay, stick cool. With it. Um, with it. Could a firm take advantage of both the PPP and the payment deferment for existing SBA loans? I think Mike, you can answer this one. Yes, you could. You can take advantage of section the subsidy. You can take advantage of as well as the PPP. Okay. Okay, and then um, uh, I'm reading through one other uh, question here. On the first go round, the SBA had a box we could check for a grant of ten thousand. So, uh, whatever happened to that money? To, does anybody know uh, what uh, what this question is about? I, I think you're talking about the IDLE program. Yep. Yeah, it looks like, like it. They're talking about EIDL. Um, <clears throat> So Sandra, if my business here's another question: If my business is a non-employee business, should apply? Should I apply for the PPP? I think you touched on this one like early on. Yes, you can absolutely apply for the program. You're eligible, uh, just as any other businesses. Um, so I guess this is a this is one of the toughest things that I've had to hear from folks, right? Because um, the loans are available. It uh, it it's comes first come first serve. So you got to get your application in. You gotta stick with that application process, um, but there are uh, stringent limitations on where you can use the money so you can get forgiveness, for example. So here's one question. If a small business receive money via the CARES Act to keep their employees, and I think this is referring to the payroll protection plan, how does that help with paying additional business overhead costs cost not covered, such as rent, food, electricity, water, you know, now that they don't have customers, now that their business is not getting any revenue, what um, any um, any thoughts yeah, on I, that? I can open it up and then and then defer to to Mike, who's done a lot of these. But you you can use it for other costs. You have to use seventy five percent for payroll costs, and you can use the other twenty five percent for mortgage interest, rent, um, and utilities. Not food, but uh, those are. Um, cash flow, um, operational costs that you can use that for. So, but that's, again, you've got to keep good records here so that when you go back at the end of this program, it all gets forgiven. Is there that's anything, a, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I mean, that's really the, where I see the biggest challenge down the road from us is this coming back to the financial institution to bring your documentation in. The, the SBA is putting the onus on the lender to approve the documentation that the funds were used correctly. I, we are advising our members to document early on what they're doing, every move, and seek our advice as we're going through this because we don't want to have a fight over what's forgiven and what's not. And a good idea is probably to, to get a separate account at that bank for that, for that loan amount. Put it in a, in a segregated account. In the, name of the, in the name of the company in which... You've applied. You cut out there, Mike. In the he's name gonna, of the I know he's going to come back on. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Mike get, get, gets cut out, but he gets back that's on. Right. I'm sorry, I, we I lost you there, Mike. Point. Make sure you get an account with the in the name of the entity that we funded the loan. SBA requires it. So, is there anything available to a sole proprietor that has no employees and does not cut a paycheck? What about that business? You bet. They're av that's available. If they are a 1099 miscellaneous, they're a, a little handyman that runs under a Schedule C, or you're a K-1 type employee or uh, uh, self-employed, those are all eligible for the program. Um, here's one more. Um, here's, a, here's a business that's communicated with a bank, um, did PPP applications for two businesses that, that this person owns, the bank calls, to take the application on one, and uh, 12 days after this person submitted uh, the form to apply, the person has yet to hear from the bank regarding the second application. Um, and so I guess we're talking about uh, manpower issue, right? Resource issue, trying to process all this uh, very big pile. Is that what's happening here? 
Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, and I just encourage all of my, my member of bankers that you cannot over communicate. I know it's tough when you're getting emails and phone calls at 10 o'clock at night at, at home. Um, I just try to remember these folks are really frustrated and they're stressed and they're trying to keep their employees. Um, so, but that's, I think what's going on there, Luigi. Yeah, it's a, it's a volume issue and we're doing mass communications to all the applicants just trying to keep, we can't call them all individually. We just sent them an update on a daily basis. We sent one last night to them and said, we're expecting that this program is going to be appropriated here shortly. Let's make sure that we're keeping, let's not take the pause to wait. Now we got to get ready to go because this is going to go faster than did round one. Well, I think we're uh, almost at our time to end. I want to thank you all for really spending your uh, morning with, with me and with our, uh, with our readers and our listeners, our viewers. Thank you for all the uh, patience that you have uh, answering all those questions. Um, Sandra, I want to ask you um, kind of a broad question, but you know, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of optimism. We are a resilient state. We've gone through cycles of recession. We've come back stronger and our economy was doing really well just before this uh, crisis hits. Um, what, what's the best thing to you to have come out out of this, um, um, I guess, uh, experience? I think the most important um, experience or the most important thing that I have seen just in the last four weeks, and it is not uncommon for Arizonans to come together, work together, support each other, help each other, but this entire state has been galvanized. Uh, the governor has uh, continued to focus on the health and well being of our citizens, making sure that we are protecting. Um, are vulnerable and, um, and those who potentially uh, are having uh, challenges through this uh, crisis, both individuals and businesses. And we are seeing the entire community come together. And Arizona has, um, during the last recession, as you know, uh, made a very intentional effort to diversify our economy, to make it a strong economy, to ensure that we had a very, very strong foundation moving forward. We had more manufacturing jobs uh, than we did construction jobs. Um, and so our economy is strong. We've got a very, very strong foundation. Um, and we are all working together uh, as business partners, as community leaders, as business leaders to ensure that our small businesses are getting the relief that they need. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, Glenn, what is your, let me ask you, uh, you might not be able to answer this one, Glenn, but let me ask you nonetheless. What is your uh, what is your best uh, case scenario for when we reopen the economy? Well, uh, let me just second Sandra's words, uh, just beautifully spoken. We're we're just all doing the best we can uh, in terms of a full reopening. Uh, that's that's still going to take some time, uh, step by step. You know, we'll start seeing some things uh, thawing out. I think sooner rather than later but but it's it's safety first and it's protecting the the hospitals uh you know the viewers asked a lot of good questions uh uschamber.com has a lot of good information on sole proprietors and independent contractors so you know i i, I think this is one we just all need to keep rolling up our sleeves uh i'm grateful for all the work uh that uh, i just want to just thank sandra watson who's been working double triple quadruple time you know, even things that might not, you know, just connecting a few dots, like the big deal with Honeywell for over 6 million masks and 500 jobs. Well, the, the personal protective equipment piece is going to be a big part of this on the employer, employee and consumer side. So we're doing a lot of the things right here, Luigi, and I have no doubt that Arizona will come out of this. Uh, it's tragic that we had to go through this, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to the other side of this stronger. I have no doubt about that. When exactly? I don't know. Now, Paul, what's the best thing that, that's emerged uh, out of this crisis for you? Uh, well, it has given me a work ethic. Uh, <laughs> I <thought> I <laughs> <before>. <laughs> uh, but I've also uh, seen the men and women of this industry really come together and step up. Uh, as Mike alluded to, they're working from home. 
the 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 broadband is a little slower there for a lot of them. <laughs> I'm sure that they get their um, their connections secure um, because we're a secure industry. But you know, my wife is um, a banker and she was on the treasury side, but she's um, stepped up and she started doing these applications um, from morning until night. And I'm sure she can't wait until this is over so she can get back to uh, banker's hours. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, you have the last word. Well, I just telling everybody to hang in there, check your bank, check your bank's website, communicate with them, uh, make yourself a priority um, squeaky wheel. It's unfortunate, it's squeaky wheel. Uh, the program is unfunded or underfunded, but you've got to stay after it. And I'm, I'm Mike's going to come back on. I know it. <laughs> hit or miss yeah yeah well uh and on that note i just want to thank everybody for for staying with us thank you for all your questions and again if you don't have a subscription to the arizona capital times uh, let me know we'll get you squared away as you know the arizona capital times is your uh, we people call us independent nonpartisan. i'd like to call us your uh, equal harassment newspaper and so uh be sure to subscribe thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day Thank you. you. Too. Bye, Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you all.